On today's show, Ricky Rubio is back. Let's talk about it and also look at the Cavs at the halfway point of the season. You are Locked On Cavs, your daily Cleveland Cavaliers podcast. The music you heard on the way in is from our friends at Astro Radio. Check them out on Apple Music or Spotify. I'm Chris Manning. I cover the Cavs and the NBA at large for a place like Diamond Up Rocks and Espinations Fear the Sword. That man over there is Evan Damerel. You can find him at Right Down Euclid, where he's the proprietor. Thanks again for making Lockdown Cavs your first listen. Uh, these episodes, as always, are produced by the one and only Jake Stevens. So, Evan, there's only one place to start. Mm-hmm. Ricky Rubio. Yeah, he's back. Is, well, he's going to play it, back. Yeah, so per, we don't know at this time exactly if everything has gone to plan, but you don't, I think, leak that out the way they did through Woj, unless you're pretty positive Ricky Rubio is yeah. going to play on Thursday against the Portland Trailblazers. So it's going to be fair. now over a year a year and some change since he tore his ACL. I was December 28th of last year in Portland. Uh, He obviously, you know, there's been a whole odyssey of how he's come back. We have seen him at games for a while now, Mm -hmm. um, working out pregame, getting up shots, going through stuff. He did. He's on, he's been traveling with the team. I mean, this feels like a big deal. I think the Cavs need him. I think they need his playmaking. I think they need his defense. I will get into some of the questions about what this exactly is going to look like, but this this feels like a moment the team has been waiting for, is excited for. He's been coming up a lot when when in media conversations. That this is a, mm-hmm. a moment I think to kind of look at as, as an important moment for the Cavs season. I absolutely agree. I, I it's funny you mentioned him kind of traveling with the team. I did see him last night in Utah because when Donovan went out, Ricky was. Right there with him because Ricky verbatim wanted to get some fan love before Donovan soaked it all up. And you watched him go through his pregame shooting drills and everything else. And um, friend of the program, Danny Cunningham, shared that while the team was in Phoenix, that J.B. Bickerstaff said Rubio is very close to returning. And Bickerstaff shared with me like a couple of days prior that like he didn't have any like remaining roadblocks or hurdles he had to clear just to get back to the court. So... I don't know where he's going to be at physically, obviously. I don't think any of us do. Um, only really Ricky and probably the Cavs training staff do at this point. And also Ricky's probably team of doctors as well. But this is a shot in the arm, at least emotionally, for this Cavs team because it's a Cavs team that struggles on the road. Um, they had a tough, very frustrating seven-point swing like, happen against them against the Jazz on um, Tuesday night as well. So... If you're the Cavs, this is just like, you know, this is a nice little spark you get. Like, this is a guy who's kind of like the cultural leader for this team. He was kind of the guy who kind of connected a lot of the pieces together. He unlocked Darius Garland a lot. He's tight with Donovan Mitchell as well and Holland Neto. He's very close with Kevin Love. Like, he, Ricky Rubio just kind of is the guy who is friends with everyone on this Cavs team. And I think having him back out there and I think just also the fact that, like, you can tell that his teammates are genuinely excited to have him back out there. Like you shared Kevin Love's Instagram story earlier today. Um, this this is this will be a good shot in the arm for the Cavs. Like, again, don't know where he's going to be at physically, and we'll obviously can dive into that more. But like just emotionally and just spiritually, in a sense, um, Rubio is going to give them a little bit of juice, at least especially tomorrow against Portland, if you know he does clear everything in play. Yeah. So the first question I think to ask about this is. How often does he play? How many minutes? Whose minutes he takes? I think the answer as far as like those first two questions is, you know, it's I think it's a highly it Fedor has already reported that he's not gonna play back to backs at least to start. That makes a ton of sense. This is the second, mm-hmm. not only just an ACL injury, the second ACL injury in the same knee. Twelve to fifteen minutes was just kind of been thrown out there. That feels about right. I think to start shorter stints is is entirely likely like three, four, five minutes at a time. And then mm-hmm. this would be one of those times where like Bickerstaff, who likes to sometimes ride out lineups a little bit when they're working, like he can't really do that with Ruby right now. Like this is going to be very regimented. I would expect this is going to be very kind of t- t- very tightly managed. And then we had seen, I, I think from there, I mean, it's like, how does this evolve over time? We're going to, we're going to, he's going to play on January 12th. What does he look like by the time we get the all-star break in, in just over a month? 
Or what does he look like, you know, by March? Like, what does he look like when you get into April and games matters? Like, this is going to be like, there is like a, uh, he's obviously been ramping up to play. And now mm-hmm. there's the ramp. This is like ramp up period 2.0, where like he's going to, what does he go through? And, and what is, what are we going to see how he's used? And what kind of little notes about what he's going to look like at full strength? Like, these are the little things I think we're going to learn the next couple of weeks. Mm-hmm. I, and it's, I, if he doesn't look good to start, I, like that wouldn't surprise me. That, that wouldn't surprise me at all. If he looks kind of, he struggles a little bit to start, it looks a little bit like you have to figure things out. If there's anything that I would feel optimistic about is that not only did he have that great success last year with Darius Garland and, and then obviously mm-hmm. had it with Donovan Mitchell in Utah before that, but this is a guy that just like kind of knows what to do and knows how to play and is just very intuitive. And I think he'll be able to navigate some of the issues in that way. But I'm curious, I am curious to see just sort of what impulse JB Bickerstaff has about where to play him and all that stuff. Yeah. It, it is going to be interesting. Like you said, he is a, he is in Bickerstaff is a bit of a proponent, like the hot hand mentality where if like, let's say Rubio is absolutely cooking out there, it's harder to kind of be cognizant of that minutes restriction at times if you're like helping you win, but also you need to be, Cognizant and aware of the fact that you all need to do right by this player so that he is physically available and ready to go come March, come April, come playoff time as well, because there are probably going to be instances where the Cavs maybe need to lead on Ricky Rubio at times just as a calming presence and a veteran presence other than like Donovan Mitchell and Kevin Love in terms of just like veterans in this rotation, maybe Jared Allen and if Karis LeVert's still here to an extent there too, but it'll be interesting to see how this kind of goes about. I'm fascinated to see how the rotations work. Um, didn't really think I'd be excited for a 10 o'clock game against Portland after <laughs> being on the road for three days, but here we are. So we'll see how this goes, obviously. But um, yeah, like you said, I just think also to fully disclose, and that's where I'm kind of like beating around the bush a little bit. Um, we don't know where Ricky's going to be at physically, and I think fans don't either. And the problem is, is the way people's attention spans are so short and how like they just expect things to just work out right away. Like, There could be times where Ricky Rubio just does not look like the same player. And realistically speaking, like J.B. Bickerstaff really prefaced this towards the top, like at the beginning of the season, like we probably won't see that same Ricky Rubio from last season. Like you might see him in glimpses and bursts, but one, there's the minutes restriction Two, there's the age three, there is the same ACL being torn twice. And like, you have to be very cautious with this because this is an investment you're making in the security behind Darius Garland and Donovan Mitchell. But I think it's just going to be more of an emotional boost right away. And then eventually the physical game will slowly catch up and we'll see maybe where Rubio is at. Maybe we see more of the Rubio that was coming back down to earth before he got hurt against the Pelicans last season. Um, But for the most part, I just think this is going to be like a big emotional boost for them. And I'm, I'm interested to see just how he looks and how he functions and it's a lot of small things too. Like I remember, I believe it was either Dylan Winner or Dean Wade like went up for a dunk, and like a lot of people asked, like, "Hey, how did you feel after that? Like with your knee and everything? Like there's gonna be moments like that for Ruby where like maybe he doesn't cut right, or maybe like it just something doesn't feel okay. Like that's the mental hurdle he has to get past now. So see how it goes, but it, it'll be a big return. And like people probably can't tell with my lack of inflection, it's just how I talk. Like I'm excited to see how he looks back out there on the floor because he was a big piece of what the Cavs built last season. Two things I will say. Number one, I think the beauty of Kim... I I think one of the excitements of Rubio coming back is that you do not need him to be what he was last year. Yeah. You just don't. like you, You don't need him to play so out of his mind that he's juicing everything and playing just like an insane basketball in that way. You just don't. like, And you have Donovan Mitchell, like, and you're gonna bring him back slowly. Secondly, I... This is this is someone that I think if everything goes correctly will need to be in the playoff rotation and provide Correct. something Cleveland needs. And if I, I am curious to just see how fast they're willing to push on that button and and push that lever down to get hit and just to see what that looks like. And like I'm I wouldn't be surprised if you see three guard lineups at some right? Like, it wouldn't surprise me yeah. if, like, you see him, Mitchell, and Garland on the floor together, and they just try different stuff. And that that is, I think, wh- what you should be doing a little bit. Well, you saw them kind of experimenting with it, at least over the last few games, where, like, you saw lineups where the Cavs are throwing out Hollow Nato, Darius Garland, shoot, even Karis Liver and Donovan Mitchell with, like, one big on the floor. Like, the Cavs could go smaller now that Ricky is back, too. And, like, there's going to be some interesting wrinkles and just ball handling stuff. And to completely circle back to, like, what you first said minutes-wise, like, Neto, 
eventually, like when Rubio is fully healthy, like wouldn't be surprised like Neto is completely phased out of the rotation. You may see less. He's not. From, like, you can't play both. You can't play both of them. Can't no, play both. It's of them. it's it's not. Doesn't make sense. And I'll be frank. Like Hollow Neto has played very well in the short burst that he's kind of had to step up for them over the last few games. But like your long term investment and in plan is in Ricky Rubio as the backup point guard, not Hollow Neto. Like there's a reason why you signed Neto to a one year vetman deal versus what you signed Rubio for. So. You just kind of have to figure out how it goes, but it's it's going to be a ramp up process. It's going to be gradual, like not playing on the second games of back to backs, or just like structuring that like cleverly at least because they had the Cavs have three back to backs before the All Star break, and then obviously reevaluate when you have like that nice long solid week off to figure things out. But yeah, it'll be interesting. And then like minutes wise, it probably soaks up Neto's minutes just at least to start, and maybe he eats an Isaac Coros a little bit, and then maybe. Karis Levert as well, and then you kind of reevaluate things after the trade deadline because the Cavs could have a couple different faces and a couple guys who are now gone, and you have to really shake things up again, for sure. But also, Baker Staff did say like he shouldn't expect to play see Rubio playing thirty to thirty five minutes a night like he did last year, just because like physically he may not have that much left in his tank like that, and just with how the ACL surgery and the recovery and rehab lined up with where they're at in the season, realistically speaking, you probably wouldn't be able to get him to play that maybe in playoffs at that point, just based on how like the timeline's going. Yeah. I think again, though, you don't need that. You're at, you're going to be asking something different out of Rubio this year Absolutely. going forward because of you got Donovan Mitchell that I think lessens just some of the burden out of what you might have expected. If they just run this back with him and that and you didn't have Mitchell, it's, it's a different conversation. But after the break absolutely. All right. After the break, we're gonna go into 41. We're 42 games in, but we're gonna do half of the season kind of where we think the Cavs are at as we hit that halfway mark. But first gotta tell you about our friends at Built Bar. If you're looking for a delicious treat but don't want all the fat and calories, then you gotta try Built Bar. Look, we're all getting just through the holidays, and I know my goal is to eat healthier in 2023. If you're like me, where you want to eat healthier but don't want to compromise taste, then I've got just the thing for you. You got to try Built. With Built, healthy is actually tasty. Seriously, these are so delicious you won't think they're good for you. This is perfect for those New Year's resolutions. What makes Built Bar so good? Well, for starters, they're covered in 100% real chocolate. That's right, real chocolate. And they come in unbelievable flavors like churro, peanut butter brownie, and coconut almond. I'm not sure how Built does it, but these bars taste like a candy bar while maintaining amazing macros. And what's even better is that they are healthy. They're only 130 calories and four grams of sugar for most of them with a whopping 17 grams of protein. And I don't need to wait around to get a box. For years, we've been telling you on Lockdown Caps to order your Built Bars at Built.com. You can still do that. But now you can find them at your local Walmart or Sam's Club. That's right. Head to the nearest Walmart today. Walk to the pharmacy section and grab yourself a box of Built Bars. You can get a four-pack there of cookies and cream, double chocolate, or coconut puffs. And if you're close to a Sam's Club, run in and grab a 13-bar box with our hit flavors. They're hit flavors. I didn't have anything to do with these. Brownie batter and churro. Thank us later. All right. Back on Lockdown Cavs, Chris Manning and Evan Damerel. Evan, so free one games into the season. Cavs, well, I think 42, 42, now, 42 heading into game 43. Where do you think the Cavs are at as we're at that? Mike, we're just right past the halfway mark. I think they are ahead of schedule in the grand scheme of things. I wrote about this stuff for right down Euclid a little bit, but I think Darius Garland going down with that eye injury at the beginning of the season was a little bit of a blessing in disguise because you forced the rest of this lineup to get really comfortable with Donovan Mitchell. And it's become more clear that they are flawed, especially at the three spot and just in wing depth and shooting in general. But I think they are ahead of schedule, at least, because I thought there was going to be more drastic growing pains, just especially with Mitchell and Garland figuring out how to play and coexist with one another. And the, yeah, there are still instances of your turn, my turn basketball that they play. But like against the Jazz, there were sequences where like they were playing in sync with one another or you go back to even the preseason game against, I believe, Philadelphia when those two played again, Rocket Mortgage Fieldhouse, like they were just in sync with one another out there. And it just carried over really well. And at the start of the regular season and the Cavs kind of started hot. And I don't want to crown them as like a title contender or even a conference contender quite yet, but they are legit. I will say that like they are able to play past their limitations and they are sitting really pretty in the top four in the East right now. And yeah, they're just, they're, they're legit and they're ahead of schedule for me. I, I think legit is the way to put it. Just to, to for for full accuracy, the Cavs are technically fifth in the East right now. Uh, they, they they are they are point zero six 
percentage points in in the terms of winning percentage behind the 76ers. Cavs are 26 and 16, the Sixers are 25 and 15. So mm-hmm. like virtually tied, but the Cavs are just a little bit behind because they've played the the two more games. So the Bucks have yes. two games in hand in that sense. So top 5 in the East. Top five in net rating currently, uh, according to the clean of the glass, the Cavs are third at dunks and threes, which is adjusted for strength of schedule. I think what this team is, Evan, is really good, but with warts. We know yes. what those warts are. Anyone who's watched them and has a pulse about basketball or like a half of a pulse knows what the limitations are. It's the wings. We we know that those are things that they would probably like to improve, and, and it's probably going to be harder to find that perfect fit. Like you may you might not find it. I th- the at the top of, they're also in a position where the top of the East is is really really tough. You yeah. have you know Kevin Durant is out right now, but the Nets have been incredible of late. The Celtics are the I I just kind of assume that at some point Chris Middleton will get healthy and and the Bucks will normalize and be better than they've been. Like the, the go get the Bucks offensive rating right now. It's a little bit wild, but they're still winning lots of games. Mm-hmm. That's just the reality of these. But this Cavs team has been good. And that can be true to me that that is true. And then there's clearly just some things you're going to figure out over time. And maybe it's, that's an off season thing, but for this season, like this team is really good. They're going to have a battle on their hands to maximize what this could be and like get out of, like make a run East this year. I, I don't know if I'd put them like firmly in my title contenders, either the net ratings and some of the metrics would tell you that like they belong in that conversation. And I think this is like a top five, six team in the NBA. And mm-hmm. like, I think we will see all some where those chips fall when we get to April and May. Yeah, I agree. And I think a lot of it, like metrics can point out like an indicate, like maybe this cast team does have the potential to be that, but I do think they do. They are still a bit green at times. They are not a good road team. I think that's like one of their bigger warts other than the wing. Depth you know who's also not a good road team though, just to, play devil's advocate. You know who also is a good road team? The Golden State Warriors. Oh, well, the Warriors are just not having a good time right now either, so... <clears throat> but, but go... I'm gonna, they're, yeah, but so the, but, but I, teams I, that are also... He, they, they are yeah. a team that is dominant at home as well. I understand what you're yeah. going with with this. One, thir- but, the Warriors are 3-16 and 16 on the road. That's freaking crazy. I just want to... I just keep... I, I think about that randomly and it blows my mind. Blows my mind. It is crazy to think about it like that, but... This cast team does have some words. I still think they have some growing up to do. They have strong statement wins over Boston twice. They come back and Donovan Mitchell has that 71 point just slaughter of the Chicago Bulls. Like that's a big win for Cleveland. Um, they're finally able to beat Milwaukee once this season for the one and two against them. They're 0 and 3 against Toronto. Like they have clear weaknesses and mismatch issues. And like the Denver Nuggets really put made a statement against them the other night as well. And like there's just a couple teams, I think, just both East and West that are ahead of them right now in terms of the pack, and also just certain teams that may have Cleveland's number or team they just kind of struggle with. Like Toronto is a bunch of 6'8 dudes who can defend really well on the perimeter and shoot, and like the Cavs struggle with that, especially when you force their bigs to defend in space. But and just as the positive and like the things that were like really good right now, I was like, yeah, they're just they're, they're legit. But I still think, like you said, they have to learn how to maximize maybe some of those what they have and also just maybe mitigate some of the limitations. That's what I was looking to say is mitigate the limitations that they have as well, just so they can kind of capitalize on what is turning into a really good season. Cause like right now, even after the loss of the jazz, they're 10 games above 500. Like that's a really good spot to be in. And yeah, they have to share a division with the Bucks, but like they're, they're in a good spot where like they're still somewhat within, they're not going to, I don't think they're going to beat Milwaukee for the division, but they're a game and a half back in Milwaukee for the central. If it really matters to folks too. So Cleveland can still realistically climb up the ladder, but I don't know if they'll go any lower than five or six in the grand scheme of like Eastern Conference standings. If they fall to six, that's a disaster. That's a disaster if they fall to six. There I would is say clear... play in is an abject failure, but like no, six I think is like six, so... no, 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 no. Six is an abject failure because the, there are there are five really good teams in the East: Boston, Brooklyn, mm-hmm. Milwaukee, Philly, and the Cavs. The Knicks, the Pacers. The Heat and the Hawks and the Bulls, like these two, like there's gonna be there's gonna be like some uncomfortable playoff matchups you could get. Like I think yeah. like Miami would be like a like if if Jimmy Butler's healthy and Kyle Lowry's like alive and like with how good Bam's playing, like that could be like an annoying first there, round series. And there are no fair guns to be seen. Right. If they fall to six, something has gone wrong. I think. I, like I agree. Cl- they, but I, six would six would be bad. See, I don't know, because I just think making the playoffs is a success in of itself. But yeah, I 
I, I think you can obviously argue with that, but I believe like again, if, if, if you going get into six, this... if you get six and you play Milwaukee in round one and you don't get home court, or you play Brooklyn in round one, that's like that's not tough. like this team has that's been too good, good and doesn't make a Donovan Mitchell trade to end up finishing six and ma- and having like a really really bad first round matchup. That is not like to me that like yes like making that real playoffs would be a step forward. All of that stuff is true. I think they have higher ambitions than that. And I think I think I that standard that they hold themselves to is is absolutely higher at this point of the season. Like you don't have a top five net rating and end up six in the East. That's just bad. I, just, I that, agree. That would be an awful I just though. maybe it's the cynic in me talking because this Cavs team was so hot this time last season too, despite Ricky Rubio go down, just be going down and then losing Colin Sexton as well, just because Darius Garland was on a tear and Evan Mobley's just rookie season was so good and Jared Allen was so consistent. And like I agree, adding Donovan Mitchell to that formula has been a huge success for Cleveland so far, but I am curious to see like what what shifts the uh, winds of change in the Eastern Conference or just the NBA in general come trade deadline time. Like maybe the Hawks finally find a way to get rid of John Collins because he just is somehow always available for a trade at any given moment. But we'll see what happens. If, if um, the Hawks finish above the Cavs in the standings, I will shave my head on this podcast. I'm not saying that'll happen, but I, I still yeah, think I mean, you, my, bring up John, you bring up John Collins and like a trade. Like I know, but I'm just saying like that's like a bigger name or like a team like that has serious aspirations because they went and got DeJounte Murray, but like they have one more clip left in the chamber and John Collins, like maybe they make a dramatic roster move and somehow like ship there because the, the, the Hawks are always just frisky to make a trade too. They're just an example I thought of off the top of my head, but. We'll see how this goes. I don't want you to shave your head. I still feel comfortable with like my overall analysis. Like I think the seal, the basement for this team rather is second round. Like they're a second round exit, but they could find a way to crack the way into the Eastern Conference Finals, just depending on how the matchups go. Like if they play like Miami and Philly, like they can get past Miami or say like somehow Chicago ekes in. It's like Chicago and like a like a team like Miami after that. Like if they find a way into the Eastern Finals, it's possible. I just. I'm still high on Boston. I'm still very high on Milwaukee, despite the Chris Middleton issues. But like Brooklyn is going to be a buzzsaw and a boat race offensively. So the Cavs could draw one of those teams as well if they somehow avoid or just maybe beat one of them and then have to face another one like that. And again, that's a pretty really that's not a pretty good spot. That's a really good spot to be in if you're trying to like build long build this out long term. And it's it's not championship or bust this year, but like they have the makings of a team that could kind of run the table in the East for years. All right, let's go on a break. We'll come back. I have two takes I want to get off. Um, and early or yeah, we we'll, with we'll two I want to get off and to finish up half of the year. But Evan, uh, you first got an ad read for us. You're absolutely right. And today's episode of Locked On Cabs is brought to you by LinkedIn. These days, every new potential hire can feel like a high stakes wager for your small business. You want to be 100 certain that you have access to the best qualified candidates available, and that's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the right people for your team faster and for free. All you have to do is add the job to LinkedIn and then add the purple hashtag hiring frame to your LinkedIn profile to spread the word that you're hiring. They also have simple tools like screening questions that make it easy to focus on the candidates with just the right skills and experience so you can quickly prioritize who you'd like to interview and hire. It's why small businesses rate LinkedIn Jobs number one in delivering quality hires versus the leading competitors. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the qualified candidates you want to talk to faster. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on NBA. That's linkedin.com slash locked on NBA to post your jobs for free. Terms and conditions apply. Back here on Lockdown Cavs, Chris Manning and Evan Damerel here. Okay, so Evan, two two things I want to say uh, as takes, takes about. Guy. All right, so one thing I do want to note: the last two weeks have been weird for the Cavs. Their offense has been better than their defense, and the defense has been like kind of averageish the last two weeks. Scoring the clean of the glass, it's been a weird little stretch. I want to just mm-hmm. note that I'm pulling this up exactly, but they are like kind of middle of the pack last couple weeks, and that's that's been kind of weird. Um, okay. Yeah, 15th in point differential last two weeks, so right in the middle of the league. 10th in offense, 19th in defense. The little bit of below average league defense. That's a, that's a little mm-hmm. bit weird. Okay, first take. That I'm sure I'm right about. I have two that I, I think I'm right about. That Donovan I'm sure Mitchell. I'm right about. I love it. Yeah. I'm not, I often think I'm very wrong and um, all of that stuff. And a lot say of self doubt. Say with your chest, with the courage and conviction to get your takes out there. I have my Ohio University uh, counseling services ball like I'm squeezing in my hand. I don't know why I even own this, but here we go. It's like a, it's like a therapy session. 
I, I had therapy today. It was wonderful. Good. Yeah. Donovan Mitchell is all NBA. I think he's on pace for first team right now. He's been that good. He has been like, I don't know if he's to me, he's like not top, like where he falls in V discussion. I don't really feel as strongly, but I don't think he's at the very, very top, but okay. Mm-hmm. I think he's been all NBA. I think the availability, I think just the, the numbers he's putting up 71 freaking points in a game, the sustained level of play he's had, how he's mm-hmm. driving the engine of this team in so many ways, mm-hmm. just the and the defensive stuff. I, I think he's mm-hmm. been awesome. This is like an all NBA guy. And if he plays at this pace the rest of the year, this is a guy that a should start in the all-star game when mm-hmm. it's back, when he's back in Utah in a month and he should be first team all NBA at this rate, just considering his, mm-hmm. how many more games he's going to play than some of the guys, at the very least, mm-hmm. this is like a second team all NBA season. And he's, he's been incredible. And like, if, if you, if you don't think this trade was like worth it and that he's been awesome and all of this stuff or that some other players could do this, you're, you're, lying you're, to yourself. you're, 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 you're absolutely full, but this dude's having an unreal season. And I almost sometimes feel like we haven't talked about it enough. It is really hard to appreciate it just because Donovan Mitchell has been like consistently very good for the moment he came to the NBA and with the Utah jazz, but it was like kind of the, just the structure of the system. Mm-hmm. And you're now watching like, yeah, he has formed a ton of good habits from his time with Utah, but he's playing with a lot more freedom as well under JV Bickerstaff. And you're seeing him now in his sixth year of the league, have his best year statistically overall, just as a player. And I absolutely agree. Like first team, all NBA certainly feels attainable for him. Like all NBA honors, which would be the first time in his career, I believe at the top of my head would be certainly on trajectory for him. Um, we talk about this a lot too. It's just like, he could have like an MVP caliber season, just with some of the games he's thrown together and how he's been for the Cavs. But like, if we're just talking about most valuable players, he's Cleveland's most valuable player. And like, just statistically speaking, like his Stats have been off the board crazy, but like the Cavs also aren't 10 games over 500 as of recording this. If they don't have Donovan Mitchell just to kind of carry and shoulder the offensive load on a night to night basis, like that game against Utah on Tuesday night, uh, the Cavs were at five and 90 seconds to go. But a lot of that was because Donovan Mitchell more or less created the or scored the offense for 50% of the points Cleveland scored in total. It's just bad defense by Karis LeVert that blew that one. So like Donovan Mitchell, more or less like his offensive motor is just absolutely insane. With how hot it runs. Like it just never seems to cool off. And like there was even nights where like he doesn't shoot it well, but he still finds a way to kind of just find a way to get, get back into the game. Maybe that's a product of JV Bickerstaff running offensive plays to get him simple looks at the bucket. But no, this is an all NBA season for him. For sure. Like I, I wouldn't say it's a hot takes. I'm starting to see it more in the vernacular, but like I absolutely agree. Like I think he is stringing something together that is just very, very legend. Wait for it. Wait for it. Dairy. Fun fact, I hate that show too. Well, yeah, I need you to bring up so that that seems like something you need to figure out why you did that to yourself. But my my roommate okay. in college watched it every day, so that's why. I think I think uh, there's a certain listener of our show who we see regularly, who I'm not giving a free shout out to today, who I think uh, is a fan. That's really significant. Other is if I'm wrong, you they they can text mm-hmm. me about that. I have another take. Darius Gar or Evan Mobley is fine. I yeah. don't you know, look. He, maybe he has not had the superstar leap, but like look at the fourth quarter <laughs> defensive performance he just put up against the Jazz. I am still thinking about that. I went back and watched like a. A big chunk of it because I was just like I need to just like watch Evan Mobley just like do some stuff and it was just like mm, that is the stuff this, this guy is unreal yes he's not having like the massive usage jump if I was in person with you right now the way I can I would throw this at your head Evan just to be clear. I'm just but, laughing so I'm thinking like you went to bed last night and your wife's so, like he's probably thinking about other women and you're just like Evan Mobley's fourth quarter defense Oh, I went cow. to bed very. I went to bed very late last night, so I. I don't even oh, I know. know where my brain was. I know. Yeah, I don't. I do not know where my brain was at at that point. But he's having like yes, like it is the the leap isn't happening. I think there's some stagnation in his offense sometimes. Like he's not hitting threes, yeah. and that's like the fable thing. But this dude is still really good. He's still on track to be like an incredible player, and it, he's impacting winning. Like I, I have literally zero concerns about Evan Mobley. If any, if any like silly idiot out there like i saw the kedrick perkins thing from yeah. from for, like that's stupid like he's playing unreal and if you don't think he's playing unreal i think you like yes like is it is he having like the massive offensive leap into like superstar status still no. i think i think there's a lot to be said about what this 2021 that 2021 draft class how all of their seasons have gone in a lot of ways yeah and, I, and where I, they're all stagnant but mobley's fine he's 
in fact, better than fine. He's very good. And I think like y'all got to stop acting like he's not. Yeah. And I think people who are like quick to say like, oh, he's not playing like Anthony Davis or, oh, he's not looking like Kevin Garnett out there. Like I, I spoke with Paul Westfall for a pretty long time during the jazz game last night. Cause I sat next to him in the press box and he was just like, I'm so impressed with how cerebral he is as a player and just like how like smart he is defensively. And like, that's so rare. And we talk about this so much last season when covering his rookie season. Like you don't see the defensive acumen that Revan Mobley has as a rookie. And I think Paul Westfall, West, that, wait, 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 did you say Paul Westfall or Paul Westhead? Because Paul Westfall is a Westhead, 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 Westhead. Because Paul, yeah, Paul West, Paul Westfall is dead. My, my apologies, my apologies, my apologies. Moving on, um, there's my blunder of the night. I'm blushing, but um, <laughs> JV Pickerstaff said it really well the other day where Evan Mobley went to a very unique situation where the Cavs had the ability to pick him third overall, but he wasn't coming into the situation where he was expected to be the number one option and get a boatload of shot opportunities Similarly to Jalen Green and like, you know, I, I love deer and Fox's assessment of the, the Rockets where he's just like, they don't pass the ball. They just run a bunch of ISO. And like, that's, that's how the Rockets play. It's just what a, what I least fun team for me to watch in the league, the Houston Rockets, just the utter they're, disaster of they're utter, utter disaster. disaster. They need a point. They need Ricky Rubio more than the Cavs. It is going to be so but, funny if James Harden goes back there, but that's another day. That's in our podcast. Have fun with hey that. Man, Jackson he's Allen and Locker Rockets. James Harden likes to support local workers and he's shopping local. You have to respect that. But back to Evan Mobley, JV Bickerstaff again said it like he doesn't have the shot opportunities because he has to share the floor with Darius Garland, who's expected to handle most of the offensive load and gets a lot of the shot opportunities at least last season. Then you have Jared Allen as a co-star as well. And so the Cavs are kind of asking Mobley to do more things defensively to kind of just be that anchor and kind of be like that weirdo alien that is able to defend in isolation and also act as like a paint facilitator next to Jared Allen. And I initially wrote about it in my takeaways for the Jazz game the other night, but like when he stepped in the fourth quarter, like he clicked all of a sudden because like at first when Jared Allen went down with that um, illness, um, you saw the Jazz kind of like start to pressure Mobley a lot in the paint, not the rim, and like. He was kind of on an island defensively, and I, he's a very unique player. Like, I don't think I've ever watched a guy like him. And then you look at the other night where they beat the Suns, he almost has a triple double. Like, he's just a uniquely wired player. And I think just now having that runway and luxury because there's Donovan Mitchell here, which again leads to less shot opportunities, um, it gives him more of that luxury to kind of find his space defense or offensively rather and kind of find where he wants to function as a player and figure out his strengths. And yeah, he talked about his three point shooting and how he wants to bring the ball up. But like, he can't really dribble the ball very well against set defenses. He's very effective in transition scenarios and also acting as like an elbow facilitator and stuff. But if you asked Evan Mobley to initiate an offensive set, like if it's against a set defense, I have a few questions at the end of the day, but that's the fun thing with him as a player. And also he's only in his second year and sure the expectations in the situation certainly change a lot of things for just how people perceive how this Cavs team should function, especially when it comes to their stars. But it's going to be fun to watch him in like year three, year four, year five, and then so on and so forth. And just like continuously level up as a player and kind of reach that next level too, just like both physically and just like mentally as a player. And like the defensive game's already there. And you just got to wait for the offensive stuff to come. And I absolutely agree with you. Like, it's just, it's incredibly lazy to say like Evan Mobley's having like a disastrous second year. Like I think maybe, yeah, disappointing is fine to say offensively, but it's pretty clear you're not watching him on a night to night basis to understand his overall impact as a player. And you're just taking a quick glance at like his, his averages on the season or what his box score numbers were for the night before. So it's just lazy stuff like that. And it does irk me a little bit. I, I I'm not affiliated with the team and like the players aren't my friends, but like, I, I do appreciate when I'm watching very good basketball being played and Evan Mobley's playing very good basketball. Evan, end on this. I just need, I, I don't want you to tell me who or, or analysis we're running long. How many yeah. All-Stars do the Cavs have as of right now? Give me a number. One. I'm going to go two. Hmm. It's, go it's, two. The, the East is tight, and I just think Donovan's a lock. Uh, Darius is a fringe, but he just hasn't played enough as of late. I I think you look at the the amount of games he's played versus other guys, I think it's actually okay, but he's the other one. But I, I think there's a good case for, for, for both of them. Mitchell's a lock. I think both of them... Um, could get there but all right that is going to be and alan's in the discussion i think as well but to me for me a little bit less so, all right that is going to be it for this episode of lockdown Cavs. 
For your second listen today, check out Game to Game NBA. Every moment, every top performance, every result locked in Game to Game covers every game from across the NBA with local analysis only locked and can deliver. Follow Game to Game on Locked in NBA. It's available on the Odyssey app, YouTube, and wherever you get your podcast. I'm Chris. That's Evan. Shout out to Jake Stevens for making this one sound beautiful. We'll talk to you tomorrow after the Cavs play in Portland and make Ricky Rubio, if all goes to plan, makes his debut.